As we've been reporting, the pandemic has called CISOs to really shift their spending priorities towards securing remote workers. Almost overnight, zero trust has gone from buzzword to mandate. What's more, as we wrote in our recent cybersecurity breaking analysis, not only must SecOps pros secure an increasingly distributed workforce, but now they have to be wary of software updates in the digital supply chain, including the very patches designed to protect them against cyber attacks. Hello everyone and welcome to this CUBE conversation. My name is Dave Vellante and I'm pleased to welcome Derek Mankey, who's Chief Security Insights and Global Threat Alliances for FortiGuard Labs with fresh data from its Global Threat Landscape Report. Derek, welcome, great to see you. Thanks so much for, for the invitation to speak. It's always a pleasure, a lot to cover. Yeah, you're welcome. So first, I wonder if you could explain for the audience, what is FortiGuard Labs and what's its relationship to Fortinet? All right, so FortiGuard Labs is, is our global SOC. It's our global threat intelligence operations center. It never sleeps and misses a beat. Um, you know, it's, it's been here since inception at Fortinet. So it's, it's 20, 21 years in the making since Fortinet was founded. Uh, we have built this in-house. Uh, so we don't OEM technology. We built everything from the ground up, including creating our own training programs for our, our analysts when we're following malware, following exploits. We even have um, a unique program that I created back in 2006. It's an ethical hacking program. And it's a zero day research. So we try to beat uh, the hackers, the bad guys to their game. And we of course do that responsibly to work with vendors, to close holes and create virtual patches. Um, and, but you know, so it's, it's everything from uh, customer protection first and foremost to following uh, the threat landscape and cyber criminals. Uh, it's very important to understand who they are, what they're doing, who they're, uh, you know, what they're targeting, and what tools are they using. Yeah, that's great. Some serious DNA and, and skills in that group. And it's, it's critical because like you said, you can, you can minimize the, the, the spread of, of those malware very, very quickly. So but what, now you have the, uh, the global threat landscape report. We're going to talk about that, but, but what exactly is that? Right, so this uh, Global Threat Landscape Report, it's a summary it's of uh, all, all the data that we collect over a period of time. So we release this uh, biannually, uh, two times a year. Um, Cybercrime is uh, changing very fast as you can imagine. So uh, while we do release security blogs and, and uh, what we call threat signals for breaking security events, we have a lot of other vehicles to release threat intelligence, but this Threat Landscape Report is truly global. It looks at all of our global data. So we have over 5 million sensors shipped worldwide and 40 guard labs we're processing. I know it seems like a very large amount, but north of a hundred billion uh, threat events in, in just one day. And we have to take the task of, of taking all of that data and put that onto scale for half a year and compile that into something um, that is, uh, in the you know, that that's digestible. Mm -hmm. That's a, a very tough task as you can imagine. So that, you know, um, we have to work with a huge technologies back from machine learning and artificial intelligence, automation, and of course, our analysts to do, to do that. Yeah, so this year, of course, it was like now every year is a battle, but this year was an extra battle. Can you explain what you saw in terms of the hacker dynamics over the past, let's say 12 months? I know you do this twice a year, but what trends did you see evolving throughout the year? And, and what have you seen with the way that attackers have exploited this expanded attack surface outside of corporate networks? Yeah, it was quite interesting. Last year certainly was not normal, like we all say. Um, and that was no exception for cybersecurity. You know, if we look at cyber criminals and, and how they pivoted and adapted to the threat landscape, cyber, cyber criminals are always trying to take advantage of the weakest link of the chain. They're trying to always uh, prey on fear and ride waves of global trends and themes. We've seen this before in uh, natural disasters, as an example, you know, um, trying to um, do charity scams and campaigns. And they're usually limited to a region where that incident happened. And they usually live about two to three weeks, maybe a month at the most. And then they'll move on to the next, uh, to, to the next trend that's breaking. Of course, because COVID was so global and dominant, um, we saw attacks coming in from uh, well over 40 different languages, as an example. Um, in regions all across the world, that wasn't lasting two to three weeks. It lasted for the better part of a year. And of course, what they're they're using this as a vehicle, right? Uh, preying on the fear. They're doing everything from initial lockdown, um, uh, phishing lures, COVID nineteen lures, to um, uh, layoff notices, then to phase one reopenings, 
all the way up to fast forward to where we are today with vaccine rollout and development. So there's always that new flavor and new theme that they were rolling out. Uh, but because it was so successful for them, uh, they were able to, they, they didn't have to innovate too much, right? They didn't have to expand and shift to, to new to new trends and themes or really develop uh, new ransom families as an example or new sophisticated malware. That was the first half of the year. In the second half of the year, um, of course, people started to experience COVID uh, fatigue, right? Um, people started to become, we did a lot of education around this. People started to become more aware of, of this threat. And so um, cyber criminals um, started to, um, as we expected, started to become more sophisticated with their attacks. We saw an expansion in different ransomware families. We saw more of a shift in focus on, on um, uh, you know, targeting the digital supply chain as an example. And so that, that, was, that was really towards Q4. Uh, so it, it was a long lived year with success on, on the COVID teams. Um, targeting healthcare as an example, a lot of um, a, a lot of the organizations that uh, were, you know, really in a vulnerable position, I would say. So, okay, I want to clarify something because my assumption was that they actually did really increase the sophistication, but it sounds like that was kind of a first half trends. Not only did did they have to adapt, not have to, but they adapted to these new vulnerabilities. Uh, my sense was that when you talk about the digital supply chain, that that was a fairly sophisticated attack. Am I Am I getting that right? That they did their sort of their 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 increased sophistication in the first half, and then they sort of deployed it. Did I, did, what, what actually happened there from your data? Well, if we look at so so generally, there's two types of attacks that we look at. We look at the um, the premeditated, sophisticated attacks that can have um, you know a, a lot of ramp up work on their end, a lot of time developing the the the, the weaponization phase, so developing. Uh, the exploits, uh, the sophisticated malware that they're going to use for the campaign, reconnaissance, understanding the targets, where platforms are developed, um, the blueprinting, that DNA of, of, of the supply chain. Those take time, um, in fact, years. Even if we look back to um, uh, 10 plus years ago with the Stuxnet attacks, as an example, that was on uh, nuclear um, centrifuges. Um, and, and that that had four different zero day weapons at the time that was very sophisticated. That took over two years to develop as an example. So some of these can take years of time to develop, but they're, they're uh, very specific in, in terms of the targets they're going to go after and obviously the, the ROI uh, from their end. Uh, the other type of attack that we see is this ongoing, um, you know, these broad wide sweeping attacks. And the reality for those ones is they don't unfortunately need to be too sophisticated. And those ones were the ones I was talking about that were really just playing on the COVID theme. And they still do today with the vaccine rollout and, and development. Uh, but but it's re really because they're just playing on, on um, you know, social engineering um, using uh, topical themes. And in fact, the weapons they're using, these vulnerabilities are from our research data, and this was highlighted actually in the first half landscape report last year, uh, on average, we're two to three years old. So we're not talking about fresh vulnerabilities you got to patch right away. I mean, these are things that should have been patched two years ago, but they're still unfortunately having success with that. So you mentioned Stuxnet, Stuxnet as the former sort of example of, one of the types of attacks that you see. And I always felt like that was a watershed moment, one of the most sophisticated, if yeah, not the most absolutely. sophisticated attack that we'd ever seen. When I talked to, to CISOs about the recent government hack, they, they, they suggest, I infer, maybe they don't suggest it, I infer that it was of similar sophistication. It was maybe thousands of people working on this for years and years and years. Is that, is that accurate or, or not necessarily? Yeah, there, there's definitely uh, there's definitely some comparisons there. Um, you know, one of the largest things uh, is that both attacks used uh, digital certificate, uh, certificate impersonation, so they're digitally signed. So, you know, of course, that whole technology using uh, cryptography is designed it's by design uh, to say that you know this piece of software installed in your system has a certificate. It's coming from the source. It's legitimate. Of course, if that's compromised that's all out the window. And um, yeah, th this is what we saw in, um, in in both attacks. In fact, looking at Stuxnet, they also had digitally signed um, you know, uh, certificates that were compromised. So when it gets to that level of, uh, of sophistication, that means definitely that there's a target, that there's been usually months of, of uh, homework done by cyber criminals for reconnaissance uh, to be able to weaponize that. What did you see with respect to ransomware, what were the trends there over the past 12 months? I've heard some data and it's pretty scary, but what did you see? 
Yeah, so ransom, ransomware is always the thorn in our side and it's going to continue to be so. Um, you know, in fact, uh, it, ransomware is not uh, new itself. It was actually first created in 1989 and they demanded ransom payments through snail mail. Uh, this was to a PO box, obviously that, that, that didn't take off, wasn't successful on um, the internet was just being born at the time. But if you look at now, um, of course, over the last 10 years, really, that's where ran the ransomware model has been uh, you know, lucrative, right? I mean, it's been um, uh, using uh, by force encrypting data on systems so that users had to, they were forced to pay the ransom because they wanted access to their data back. Data was the target currency for ransomware. That shifted now. And that's actually been a big pivot over the last year or so because again, before it was this, let's cast a wide net, in fact, as many people as we can randomly. Um, and try to see if we can hold some of their data for ransom. Some people that data may be valuable, may not be valuable. Um, and that model still exists uh, and we see that, but really the big shift that we saw last year in the threat landscape report was a shift to targeted ransom. So again, the sophistication is starting to rise because they're not just going after random data, they're going after data that they know is valuable to large organizations. And they're taking that a step further now. So there's various ransomware families we saw that have now reverted to um, extortion and blackmail, right? So they're taking that data, encrypting it and saying, unless you pay us this large sum of, of money, um, we're going to release this to the public or sell it to a buyer uh, on the dark web. And of course you can imagine the amount of, um, you know, damages that can happen from that. The other thing we're seeing is, is a target of ransom going to revenue services, right? So if they can cripple networks, it's essentially a denial of service they know that the company is going to be bleeding um, you know, X millions of dollars a day, so they can demand Y million dollars of ransom payments. And that's effectively what's happening. So it's again, becoming more targeted uh, and more sophisticated. And unfortunately the ransom's going up. Yeah, they go, they go to where the money is. And of course your job is to, to lower the ROI for them. Uh, <laughs> a constant challenge. Um, yeah. we, we talked about some of the attack vectors uh, that you saw this year that, that uh, cyber criminals are targeting. I wonder if, if, you know, given the work from home, if things like IOT devices and cameras and, you know, you know thermostats uh, with 75% of the workforce at home, is this infrastructure more vulnerable? I guess, of course it is, but what did you see there in terms of attacks on those devices? Yeah, so on, on uh, you know, unfortunately, the attack surface, as we call it, uh, so the, the amount of target points is expanding. It's not shifting; it's expanding. We still see, um, so I mentioned earlier, vulnerabilities from two years ago that are being used. In some cases, you know, over the holidays for e-commerce, we, we saw e-commerce heavily under attack, and e-commerce has spiked since last summer. Right? It's been a huge amount of traffic increase. Everybody's shopping from home. And uh, those vulnerabilities going after shopping cart plugins, as an example, are five to six years old. So we still have this theme of old vulnerabilities are still new in a sense being attacked, but we're also now seeing this complication of, yeah, as you said, IOT uh, being rolled out everywhere and the, the really quick shift to work from home. Uh, we really have to treat this as, a, as, as the uh, distributed branch model for enterprise, right? And it's really now the secure branch, how do we take um, um, you know, any of these devices on, on those networks and secure them. Uh, because yeah, if you look at the, what we highlight in the landscape report in the top 10 attacks that we're seeing, so hacking attacks, hacking attempts, this is who are IPS uh, triggers. You know, we're seeing attempts to go after IOT devices. Um, right now they're mostly uh, favoring, uh, well, in terms of targets, um, consumer grade routers. Uh, but they're also looking at um, uh, DVR devices, as an example, for uh, you know home entertainment systems, uh, network attack storage as well, and IP security cameras. Um, some of the newer devices, uh, what the quote unquote smart devices uh, that are now on you know virtual assistants and home networks, uh, we actually released a predictions piece at the end of last year as well. So this is what we call the new intelligent edge. And that's what I think is, is we're really going to see this year in terms of what's ahead. Um, so we always have to <laughs> look ahead and, and yeah. uh, prepare for that. But yeah, right now, unfortunately, the story is all of this is still happening. IOT is being targeted. Of course, they're being targeted because they're easy targets. Um, 
it's like for cyber criminals, it's like shooting fish in a barrel. There's not just one, but there's multiple vulnerabilities, security holes associated with these devices, easy entry points into networks. I mean, it's, I mean, attackers, they're, they're highly capable, they're organized, they're, they're well-funded, they move fast, they're, they're agile, uh, and they follow the money, as we were saying. Uh, yeah. you, you mentioned, you know, vaccines and, you know, big pharma, healthcare. Uh, where did you see advanced persistent threat groups really targeting? Were there any patterns that emerged in terms of either industry types or organizations being targeted? Yeah, so just to be clear again, when we talk about APTs, um, uh, advanced persistent threat group, the groups themselves, they're targeting, uh, these are usually the more sophisticated groups, of course. So going back to that theme, these are usually the, tar the, um, the premeditated targeted attacks, usually points to nation state. Um, sometimes, of course, there's overlap, they can be affiliated with cyber crime. Cyber crime uh, uh, groups are typically um, looking at some other targets for ROI. Uh, but there's there's a blend, right? So as an example, if we look at the um, APT groups uh, last year, um, absolutely number one, I would say, would be um, healthcare. Healthcare was one of those, and this it's it's it's, it's um, you know very uh, unfortunate. But obviously, with the shift that was happening and uh, pop up medical facilities, there's a big a, a rush to change networks uh, for a good cause, of course. But with that came, um, you know, uh, security holes and concerns and targets. And, and, and that's what we saw APT groups uh, targeting was going after those. And, and ransomware and the cyber crime front followed as well, right? Because if you can follow um, those critical networks and cripple them on, from a cyber criminal's point of view, you can, um, you can expect them to pay the ransom because they think that they need to in order to um, get those systems back online. Uh, in fact, last year too, unfortunately, we saw the first um, uh, death that was caused because of a denial of service attack in healthcare, right? Facilities mm -hmm. weren't, weren't available because of the cyber attack. Patients had to be diverted and didn't make it on the way. All right, Jarek, I'm sufficiently bummed out. So maybe in the time remaining, we can talk about remediation strategies. You know, we know there's no sil silver bullet in, in, in security. Uh, but what approaches are you recommending for organizations? H how are you, you know, consulting with folks? Sure, yeah, so a couple of things. Um, good news is there's a lot to, that we can do about this, right? And, um, and, and basic measures go a long way. So a couple of things just to get out of the way, um, I call it uh, housekeeping and cyber hygiene, but it's always worth reminding. Um, so uh, we talk about keeping uh, security patches up to date. We always have to talk about that because that is reality. As I said, these, these vulnerabilities that are still being successful are five to six years old in some cases, um, the majority two years old. Um, so being able to do that, manage that from an from a, uh, uh, organization's point of view, really treat the new work from home. I, I don't like to call it work from home because the reality is it's work from anywhere a lot of the times for some people. So really treat that as as the um, as a secure branch uh, methodology. Doing things like segmentations on networks, secure Wi-Fi access, multi-factor authentication is is a huge must, right? So using multi-factor authentication because passwords are dead. Um, using things like uh, XDR. So uh, XDR is, is a combination of detection and response for endpoints. This is a mass centralized management thing, right? So uh, endpoint and detection and, and response as an example. Those are all, um, you know, good security things. So of course, having security inspection, uh, that, that's what we do. So good threat intelligence baked into your security solution. Uh, that's supported by labs angles. So uh, that's, uh, you know, uh, antivirus, intrusion prevention, web filtering, sandboxing, so forth. But then it gets, that's, that's the security stack. Beyond that, it gets into the end user, right? Everybody has a responsibility. This is that supply chain we talked about. The supply chain is, is, is a target for attackers. Um, but attackers have their own supply chain as well. And we're also part of that supply chain, right? The end users, we're, we're constantly fished for social engineering. So using phishing uh, campaigns against employees to, to better do training and awareness is, is always recommended too. Um, so that's what we can do, obviously. Uh, that's what's recommended to secure um, the, the, the endpoints and the secure branch. There's things we're also doing in the industry um, to fight back against cybercrime as well. 
Well, I, I want to actually talk about that and, and talk about ecosystems and collaboration because while you have competitors, you all want the same thing. You, you, SecOps teams are like superheroes in my book. I, I mean, they're trying to save the world from the bad guys. And I remember I, I was talking to Robert Gates on theCUBE a couple of years ago, the former defense secretary. And I said, yeah, but don't we have like the best security people and, and can't we go on the offensive and, and, and weaponize it ourselves? Of course, there's examples of that. US government's pretty good at it, even though they won't admit it. But in his answer to me was, yeah, we got to be careful because we have a lot more to lose than many countries. So I thought that was pretty interesting. But how do you collaborate with whether it's the US government or other governments or, or, or other, other competitors even, or your ecosystem? Maybe you could talk about that a little bit. Yeah, th th this is what this is what uh, makes me tick. Uh, I, I I love working with industry. I, I've actually built programs for 15 years of collaboration in, in the industry. Um, so you know, we we need. I, I always say we can't win this war alone. You actually hit on this point earlier. You talked about uh, following and trying to disrupt the ROI of cyber criminals. Mm -hmm. Absolutely, that is our target, right? We're always looking at how we can disrupt their business model. Uh, in, in, and in order, there, there's obviously a lot of different ways to do that, right? So a couple of things we do is resiliency. That's what we just talked about, increasing the security stack so that they go knocking on someone else's door. But beyond that, uh, it comes down to private-private sector collaboration. So uh, we, we uh, co-founded the Cyber Threat Alliance in 2014, as an example. This was our fierce competitors coming in to work with us to share intelligence because like you said, um, we're competitors in the space, but we need to work together to do the better fight. And so this is that Venn diagram, let's compare notes, let's team up uh, when there's a breaking attack and make sure that we have the intelligence so that we can still remain competitive on the technology stack, the integration, the solutions themselves. Uh, but let's let's level the playing field here because cyber criminals move without, uh, you know, um, uh, that, that there's no borders and they move uh, with great agility. So uh, that's one thing we do in the private private sector. Uh, there's also uh, public private sector relationships, right? So we're working with um, Interpol as an example, Interpol Project Gateway, and that's when we find attribution. So who, it's not just the, what are these people doing, like uh, infrastructure, but uh, who who are they? Where are they operating? Uh, what what advanced tools are they creating? We've actually worked on cases that are led down to to um, uh, warrants and arrests, um, you know, in some cases, one case was a $60 million business email compromise uh, fraud scam. The great news is if you look at the industry as a whole, uh, over the last three to four months, there's been four takedowns. Uh, Emota, NetWalker, uh, um, there's also eGregor uh, recently as well too. And, and eGregor, they're actually going in and arresting the, the affiliates. So not just the, the CEO or the kingpin of these organizations, but the people who are distributing their ransomware themselves. And that was an unprecedented step, really important. So you really start to paint a picture of this, again, supply chain, this ecosystem of cyber criminals and how we can hit them where it hurts on all angles. Uh, most recently, um, I've been heavily involved with the World Economic Forum. Uh, so I'm co-author of a report from last year, uh, the Partnership on Cybercrime. And uh, this is really not just the private private sector, but the private and public sector working together. We know a lot about cyber criminals. We can't arrest them. Uh, we can't take servers offline from data centers. Uh, but working together, we can have that whole you know that holistic effect. Great, thank you for that, Derek. What if people want want to go deeper? Uh, I know you guys mentioned you do blogs, but are there other resources that that they can tap? Yeah, absolutely. So uh, everything you can see is on our uh, threat research blog on, uh, so Fortinet blog, it's under threat research. Uh, we also put out uh, playbooks for what we're, we're doing. Uh, this is more for the, um, the heroes, as you call them, the security operations centers. Uh, we're doing playbooks on uh, the adversary. So this is a, a playbook on the, on the offense. What are they up to? How are they doing that? That's on fortiguard.com. Uh, we also release uh, threat signals there. So uh, we, we typically release uh, about 50 of those a year. And those are all um, our, our insights and views into specific attacks that are happening. Well, Derek Mackey, thanks so much for joining us today. And thanks for the work that you and your teams do, very important. Great, thanks. It's, yeah, it's a pleasure and uh, rest assured, we will still be there 24 seven, 365. Good to, good to know. And thank you for watching everybody. This is Dave Vellante for theCUBE. We'll see you next time.